Buonasera, benvenuti alla Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimoda alla New York University. Grazie. My name is Stefano Albertini, I'm the director of the Casa. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here tonight, members of the Casa, members of the, and supporters of the Bogliasco Foundation, and friends. And if it's the first time you're here and you're interested in anything that is even remotely to do with Italy, sign up for our mailing list from our website. And uh, before you leave the building, I also suggest you take a look at the current exhibit on display on the ground floor. Um, it's called Vintage 1964, and it's a group of beautiful black and white photographs uh, taken all in 1964 um, by a young photographer, a young girl at that time, um, who now resides here in New York, a couple of blocks from here, actually. It was uh, reviewed very positively by CNN.com and many other publications, and to me the photos are just beautiful. So if you miss Italy and you miss that Italy that doesn't exist anymore, <laughs> Uh, go down memory lane and take a, a good look at the exhibit upstairs. But now, it's a great pleasure again to welcome back the friends of the Bogliasco Foundation. They do incredible work and we have a, a somehow a proof of the validity of what they do uh, through these meetings that they organize because uh, I believe always the people that you invited to speak here at the Casa have been previous fellows of the Foundation. So it gives you a sense of the uh, value uh, of the level, intellectual and cultural level of their fellows and of the very interesting mix of people that they bring together. That's another uh, specific feature of the Bogliasco Foundation, putting together artists, writers, scholars, and all of the, uh, this array of culture that they concentrate in this very intimate space that is very conducive to study and to writing. Um, is very happily exemplified uh, by the many uh, meetings and encounters that I have here. As always, I don't want to take away from uh, Laura Harrison, who is the president of the, of the Bogliasco Foundation, the, pres the pleasure of introducing to you uh, her speaker and a former fellow of the Bogliasco Foundation. So please welcome Laura Harrison. Thank you so much, uh, Stefano. Um, as always, it's uh, such a joy for us to be here. Um, and uh, I need to thank Stefano, Kostya, the uh, entire staff of Casa Italiana. This is, in fact, um, our eighth uh, collaboration here. Um, we've been doing, um, ha happily, we've been doing events here at the Casa Italiana for five years. Um, this is our eighth one. Um, we love being able to show work that was developed in Italy at our program in Italy here to a New York audience. It gives us a wonderful opportunity to do so. Um, and for that, we're deeply grateful. So thank you so much. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a couple more words about the Bogliasco Foundation for those of you who are not familiar with what we do. We are an American nonprofit with an operation in Italy. Um, our mission is to support the arts and humanities and international cultural exchange by providing residential fellowships for artists and scholars from all around the world at our residency program in Boyasco, which is a very small town near the city of Genoa. Um, our focus is really on encouraging cross-pollination in a very diverse community that's comprised of some of the world's most innovative minds. We have had in 21 years of operation nearly 930 fellows from 58 countries all around the world and counting. Um, one of the hallmarks of our program is promoting meaningful exchange, both in our community in Italy and also via our outreach program here in New York. Um, usually these are programs that feature work that was developed in residence like tonight's program, in fact. And we're absolutely thrilled that we have Barry Strauss with us tonight. Um, talking about uh, leadership models and Hadrian, and um, it's all very timely and uh, I think quite relevant for us today, and I can't wait to hear all about it. Um, I'm sure you too. Um, <laughs> so Barry is a, a classicist. He is a 
historian of war, leadership, and democracy. He's the recipient of numerous awards and fellowships. He's a professor of humanistic studies at Cornell University. He's also the former director of Cornell's uh, Institute for Peace and Conflict Studies and the founder of Cornell's program on freedom and free societies. He's the author of eight books, many of which uh, I think have been translated into as many as 11 languages. Um, his most recent publication uh, is entitled The Death of Caesar, The Story of History's Greatest Assassination. And it has been hailed as brilliant by the Wall Street Journal among many others and sounds like a great read and I'm actually dying to read it. Um, there will be a short Q&A following Barry's presentation. We have a small reception upstairs after that. Please join us at both. And now, please join me in, in welcoming Barry Strauss. Thank you, Laura, for that very generous um, introduction. And I'd also like to uh, thank the Casa Italiana um, and uh, Jennifer and Ariel, um, and everyone at the Bolyaska Foundation, um, and, and all of you uh, for coming here this evening. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, and there's no way for me adequately to express my gratitude to the Foundation uh, for their support and for the uh, remarkable environment that they provided uh, me and all of the fellows, uh, both a physical environment and also a social, cultural, intellectual environment, as Laura said, it's just a um, really diverse and uh, yet somehow interlocking and meshing group of people at Bolyasco. So uh, my story actually begins there in this beautiful spot. This is not a doctored photo. This is actually <laughs> what it looks like um, uh, at the foundation and gives you some sense of uh, why we love it so much. Um, it was a, a remarkable place for me to be working on uh, my project. Uh, I'm currently writing a book uh, called The Caesars, and uh, it is about Roman emperors and the women in their lives. And, um, um, I, I worked in particular on Hadrian uh, when I was at uh, Bolyasco. So without further ado, I will now turn to uh, the Emperor Hadrian. If you've been to any uh, classical art museums or uh, collections, Hadrian is a familiar sight to you. He's inescapable. In fact, uh, he is the Roman emperor and possibly the Roman of whom more portraits survive from the ancient world than of anyone else. Uh, you see him here um, in this picture. Uh, as you can see from the picture, he is a striking uh, person. Uh, he's got a full head of hair and bearded, and perhaps uh, the face conveys something of his intelligence and something of his power. Hadrian reigned as emperor in the second century of our era, the second century AD, from 117 to 138. And that makes him chronologically come pretty much in between the two bookends of the Roman Empire, as, as I see it, uh, between the founder of the empire, Augustus, who we see here in a uh, statue from Herculaneum, where he's portrayed as Jupiter, and the re-founder of the empire, Constantine, who we see here uh, in a bronze bust in the Capitoline Museum in Rome. Uh, Augustus, well, the conventional dates of his rule are 27 BC to 14 AD. Constantine, 306 to 337 AD. And so Hadrian, uh, chronologically, is about in the middle, 117 to 138. But the similarities between these three men are, are more than just a chronological accident. Because in a real sense, Hadrian was a second Augustus. He certainly saw himself as a second Augustus. And he saw himself as refounding the Roman Empire uh, and putting it on a new footing. And I'd like to talk uh, tonight, one of the themes I want to touch on is just how he saw himself doing this uh, and what he meant uh, by that. Under Hadrian, the empire was at its height. Uh, I think this will be a pointer. No, OK. Well, it extended uh, from uh, Hadrian's Wall, aptly named, uh, in northern England, near just south of the Scottish border, all the way down through the Mediterranean to what is today 
Syria. Uh, as we'll see in a moment, it was slightly larger geographically uh, bef just before Hadrian. But in terms of peace and prosperity, uh, the Roman Empire uh, was at its height under Hadrian and his successor in the second century AD. Ah, oh, great, thank you. <laughs> so here we go, uh, Hadrian's Wall over here. Um, and you can see the empire uh, in uh, what is today France, Belgium, the Netherlands, the western part of Germany, Switzerland, down to Italy, of course, Spain, Portugal, North Africa through Egypt, into the Levant, Syria, what is today Turkey, Greece, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, the former Yugoslavia, uh, parts of Hungary, and Austria. An enormous empire all under one rule from northern Britain to Syria. Now Hadrian was not a simple person. Uh, even in antiquity, he was described as a person of paradox. In the same person, austere and genial, dignified and playful, dilatory and quick to act, stingy and generous, deceitful and straightforward, cruel and merciful, and always in all things changeable. We'll have other judgments of Hadrian as well, but in speaking of him as a leader, um, I want to balance two sides. I want to balance the ways in which he was a good leader and the ways in which he was a bad leader, the ways in which he is a model to emulate and a way in which he is an example to avoid. Um, as a good leader, Hadrian was a master of the art of the courtier and the craft of the marketer, but above all, he was a uh, genius, uh, he was a visionary genius. As a bad leader, the same man was vain, intolerant, and murderous. We see both sides in the same person. We get perhaps some sense of it here in this coin. This is a coin from Judea from the year 130 AD. And, and there you see the coin on, t oops, this is the pointer. It's the coin, and here is some indication of what it says. Hadrianus Augustus. Consul for the third time, P.P., Pater Patriae, Father of the Fatherland. And here uh, is Hadrian uh, greeting the province of Judea. Um, it's, this commemorates the uh, arrival, the advent of the Augustus uh, in Judea uh, by uh, the order of the Senate. The coin is issued uh, on, by the order of the Senate. Uh, although Hadrian was welcome in Judea, Judea turns out to be the site of his greatest atrocity. And so we'll see that the same man who could be so gentle could also be so cruel. Well, the story begins in the reign before Hadrian, the reign of this man, the Emperor Trajan, who uh, ruled Rome between the years 98 and 117 AD. Trajan was a great soldier. He loved being a soldier. He was a military man above all. And though he excelled in so many different ways that he was given the name by the Senate of the best prince, the best ruler, he is perhaps most well known for the conquest of the province of Dacia, nowadays Romania, and also for the attempted conquest of Iraq. For neither the first nor the last time in history, his conquest was not successful. Though it was certainly, uh, uh, he put a great deal of effort into it. Uh, he was a man who brought back a great deal of wealth to Italy, and his building program in Rome is very visible if you visit Rome today. Uh, he was also an early proponent of a sort of social welfare system for uh, the young people of Italy. So all around a very important, significant emperor, uh, the most military emperor that Rome had had since Augustus, uh, the one who did the most to try to expand the empire's boundaries. Now, Hadrian had the advantageous position of being Trajan's relative. He was his, Hadrian's father was Trajan's second cousin, so that makes Hadrian's Trajan's second cousin uh, once removed. They both came from Spain. They were descended from Roman colonists in Spain, but they both spent most of their lives outside of Spain 
in Italy. In fact, Hadrian was born in Rome and did not often go back to Spain to visit the family estate. He was a man who, a young, young Hadrian was very different from Trajan in many ways. While Trajan was a bluff military man with little time for intellectual things, Hadrian was a great student. He loved arts, letters, architecture. He was an all-round great student. So enamored of Greek philosophy and Greek thought that he was given the nickname Graeculus, the little Greek. That was not entirely a compliment. Uh, from in Roman eyes, particularly not in the eyes of a man like Trajan, uh, who is suspicious of too much learning and suspicious of anything that was uh, different from being Roman. Nonetheless, Hadrian was unstoppable. He was ambitious, he was brilliant, he was talented, he was a skilled soldier as well uh, as a philosopher, he was a fantastic public speaker, and he knew what he wanted and how to get it. He, at the age of 24, he marries this woman, Vibia Sabina. Uh, it's unfortunate that the statue is somewhat damaged, but you might get a sense of just how beautiful she was. It's true that statues of the uh, Rome's rulers are airbrushed, uh, but, they, but they also have some relationship to reality because the rulers wanted to be recognized. And all of the statues that we have of Sabina, and we have quite a few, uh, they all speak to uh, her uh, attractiveness. Not just good, her good looks, but there's something, um, something radiant about her nature. She also happened to be uh, Trajan's closest uh, descendant. Trajan had no children of his own. He was married, but had no children. And uh, Sabina was, tra was Trajan's grand niece. She was the granddaughter of Trajan's sister. So she's a very important person. When Hadrian was 24 and Sabina was 14, mm -hmm. they married. It's, the uh, minimum age of marriage for a Roman woman was 12. Uh, 14 is a little on the young side, but the imperial family often married young because they wanted to produce heirs. And in marrying Sabina, Hadrian had the inside track uh, to be uh, Trajan's successor. He had something else as well, and that is the affections of this woman. Uh, this is Trajan's wife, uh, and her name was Plotina, Pompeia Plotina. Uh, this is a statue from the Vatican. Uh, and uh, she was a very powerful lady indeed. She was quite wealthy. She owned a series of brickworks, and the construction business was a really good business to be in Rome in the second century AD, the period when many of the great buildings of the city come from. Here you can see her name. Nope, I just got used to this, sorry. You can see her name, Plotina. Or you can't see her name because, ah, yes, good. There's Plotina. Uh, and this is the name of the foreman of her brickworks, Valeria Nike. That was no foreman, that was a forewoman. Uh, really interesting that Plotina uh, is a woman who owns this property and the the foreperson of her uh, brickworks estate is also a woman. There's some debate among scholars as to whether Plotina uh, stayed at home baking cookies, um, uh, which I don't think she did. Uh, there are some official discourses for Trajan that say that basically what, that's what she did, and she, unlike some Roman imperial women, uh, knew how to uh, not to get in the way. But there is plenty of other evidence that she was quite powerful, quite significant person, like many Roman women, behind the scenes, uh, she exercised a great deal of power, and sometimes not so behind the scenes. She welcomed ambassadors as well to Rome. More important, she adored Hadrian. Like Hadrian, she was a great uh, devotee of Greek culture, and particularly of Greek philosophy, and she did everything she could to advance his career. He married Sabina. Uh, he rises in political and diplomatic offices and military offices as well. He holds a series of important positions in the empire so that uh, by the time we reach uh, uh, late in Trajan's reign, um, he is one of the most important people. Now, uh, perhaps through uh, Plotina, uh, Hadrian rises to become governor of Syria in 117, uh, when 
Trajan is coming back from his wars. So as I said earlier, Trajan has a series of very successful campaigns where he conquers Dacia, Romania, really important place to conquer because it is very rich in gold. And if you go to Rome and you see Trajan's market and the remains of Trajan's forum or in Trajan's column, and you wonder, how did they pay for all that? It was from the gold of Dacia. And then Trajan, not content with that, wanted more. He wanted to go to war with the Parthian Empire. The Parthian Empire was the Iranian Empire, the Iranian kingdom uh, in this period of Roman history. It was the only great empire left standing in the ancient world with whom Rome could compete. And the Romans competed with the Iranians for many centuries. Uh, and they never seemed to learn that it was not going to go well. And under, uh, under, Hage, under Trajan, it's one of the examples when it did not go well, he marched in all the way uh, through uh, Mesopotamia, what's now Iraq, as far as the Persian Gulf. He stands on the Persian Gulf and is said to weep because he says he's too old to follow in Alexander's footsteps and go all the way to India. And then he goes back, and the minute he turns his back, uh, the Mesopotamia erupts in rebellion, uh, in guerrilla warfare, um, and he is thwarted in his attempt to reconquer the place because now Trajan is ill. He has a stroke, and his, uh, as often happened in this period, his wife and sister were with him. Um, not his sister, actually, his, uh, his niece. His wife and niece were with him and convinced Trajan to go back to Rome while he still could. But it didn't succeed because on the way back to Rome, on the way back to Rome, Trajan dies here in this out of the way place in Salinas, uh, in southern Turkey, uh, in one, summer of 117 AD. Now, Hadrian had been rising in Trajan, under Trajan's uh, government uh, all this time, but he, um, Trajan never officially adopted him nor did he give him the official title that an heir should get, the title of Caesar, nor did he give him the powers that Roman emperors often gave to the people who they wanted to succeed him. It seems as if Trajan was not 100% sold on Hadrian, having Hadrian as his successor. And as we'll see, there's a very good reason for that. Trajan dies, and one story says that on his deathbed, he names Hadrian as his successor. Another story says that Trajan dies and doesn't name anyone as a successor. It's Plotina, his wife, who forges the papers that says that, Hadrian, uh, that Trajan named Hadrian as a successor. And there's another story that says she actually hired an actor to impersonate Trajan uh, to make people think that Trajan was speaking. Um, not too likely that's true. Whatever the case, the word goes to um, Hadrian, who's here in Antioch in Syria. He's the governor of Syria. And Hadrian does not wait for the Senate to officially name him emperor. Instead, he allows his troops, his legions, to acclaim him as emperor. And the most important gathering of Roman legions in the world at this point is in the east. Hadrian has the legions on his side, and he says, sends the news to the Roman Senate, hey, I have good news. I'm the emperor now. Uh -huh. <laughs> and here is Trajan, uh, Hadrian, excuse me, Hadrian uh, in wearing armor. He's now emperor in the summer of 117 AD. Hadrian is a man with a plan. And if Trajan's plan was to expand Rome by military means, Hadrian's plan is to end the expansion. Now, this is not a new story in Rome. Emperors had disagreed over this before. In fact, most emperors after Augustus, the founder of the empire, agreed that Rome was big enough and could not afford, for various reasons, to expand further. It's Trajan who is unusual, not totally unusual, but certainly striking in the effort he puts into expanding the empire. As soon as Hadrian becomes emperor, emperor, the first thing he does is makes peace with Parthia, the Iranian empire. He pulls back the remaining Roman troops that are uh, in Parthian territory. He even pulls back some of Rome's troops from Dacia, from the eastern part of Dacia, today Romania. This leads to a lot of pushback from Trajan's supporters and other Romans who felt that this was un-Roman to pull back from this sort of thing. And Hadrian now uses one of his supporters, the head of the Praetorian Guard in Rome, and he arranges to assassinate, to murder, 
four of the leading politicians in Rome, ex-consuls, who were advocates of expansion and rivals for Hadrian to the throne. Uh, these four shocking murders make a point that Hadrian's in charge now. And the Roman Senate, and here we see the Senate House from late antiquity, is forced to accept Hadrian as ruler. They, they do. He makes his way to Rome, where Hadrian proceeds to make friends in Rome, particularly with the Roman people, by burning records of taxes that are due. He burns them publicly. It's a, a great and very visible form of tax rebate, and it makes Hadrian quite popular. Hadrian plans to devote a lot of energy to Rome, and so he does. But Hadrian always has his eye on the empire as a whole. He has very wide horizons. In fact, of all of Rome's emperors, nobody traveled as much as Hadrian did. He's the most well-traveled of all of Rome's emperors uh, and spends at least a half of his reign uh, abroad. Uh, early on, and with him, wherever he goes, he has an entourage. Usually, Sabina is with him and various other officers and officials. Sometimes as many as 5,000 people travel with Hadrian. It's not a fun day for your town if you have to entertain <laughs> the emperor. Early on in his reign, he goes to Germany, and there he supervises the building of a wall, a wooden wall stretching for several hundred miles to mark the boundary of Roman Germany and the quote-unquote barbarians over the border. And then, even more famously, he goes to Britain, to near uh, where, what is now Newcastle on Tyne. And there he um, certainly orders, and perhaps is there for the uh, starting, the first brick, as it were, of Hadrian's Wall, uh, the most famous uh, segment of the wall uh, snaking over the uh, English countryside, 73 miles from east to west. Hadrian's Wall is kind of spectacular to visit, but when you look at the nitty-gritty, it's not quite as impressive. In fact, it was rather shoddily and hastily built, and it's hard to avoid suspicion uh, that a lot of the money that was earmarked for the wall was pocketed by the contractors. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. But that's not as bad as it might seem, because the purpose of Hadrian's Wall was not to serve like the wall in Game of Thrones. It was not meant to keep keep people out. Rather, it was mean, meant to control the border. It actually went through areas and cut people apart from each other, cut uh, native Britons apart from each other. It was quite a scar on the landscape. Uh, but it was meant to be a, board, a form of border control and also a symbol, both to people in Britain and in Rome, that this was it, that the Roman world had reached its limit, that from now on, Rome would be on the defensive. Uh, the famous Roman limes, the fortification system of the frontiers, are now put into place, or I should say uh, they are extended. This is the great period of fixed frontier defense for the Roman Empire. This, of course, raises the problem of how the Romans are going to uh, keep their military readiness when the army is not actually engaging in all that much combat anymore. Hadrian's solution is that he would take the leadership by visiting as many military bases as possible around the empire. And we actually have a record, an inscription, <coughs> recording one of his visits to a base in what is today Algeria. He watches a, a demonstration of cavalrymen on maneuvers, and then he says that the outstanding manhood of that noble man, my legate Catilinus, shows itself in that you are the man you are serving under this man. So Hadrian, very much a soldier's guy, uh, he marches under the hot sun. We're told that he marches once for 20 miles in armor under the hot sun of Africa and the snows of Germany. Uh, all over the empire, he is traveling uh, and leading the way. He's also a great sportsman. His favorite sport is boar hunting. And we have images of Hadrian uh, spearing the boar, um, all an example to show that while Rome uh, has, is no longer expanding militarily, it hasn't lost its edge. But that's only part of Hadrian's vision for the Roman Empire. If Trajan saw uh, the Roman Empire as a true empire, a conquering empire, Hadrian saw it more as a commonwealth, more like the EU than, say, the Roman Empire. 
and Hadrian's particular interest was in the East. It's not just for sentimental reasons, and here we're looking, of course, at Athens, uh, at the Acropolis, the Parthenon, and the uh, Propylia, etc. It's not just for sentimental reasons, although Hadrian was a devotee of Greek philosophy, such as uh, Socrates, as we see here, but it's also because throughout the history of the Roman Empire, the Romans felt the pull of the East. Uh, not for Orientalist religions either, but rather that's where the money was, that's where the wealth was, that's where the population was. The Roman East was the powerhouse of wealth, money, and population uh, for the empire. And so the Romans always were tempted by the East. Augustus had resisted the temptation. You might remember that Augustus wins his power by defeating a, a coalition of Antony and Cleopatra based in Alexandria, Egypt. He and it decisively makes clear that the capital of the empire will be in Rome. Hadrian's not so sure. He revisits it. He makes Athens the center of a league of Greek states. He makes Athens the Panhellenic center, and he devotes a huge amount of time, energy, and money to building up Athens, a city that had made him a citizen, by the way, ever be before he became em emperor. Smart move on the part of the Athenians. Hadrian built libraries, uh, marketplaces, aqueducts, cultural centers, and above all, this temple, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, uh, which you can see here in the foreground. It originally had over 100 columns, and it was the largest temple in the Greek world. It had been begun over 600 years earlier by the tyrant of Athens, and then uh, in, the, in, in the 6th century BC, and then in the 2nd century BC, the Greek king of Syria tried to complete it. His name was Antiochus Epiphanes. Epiphanes means the god manifest, Anti Antiochus the god manifest. But he had many detractors, and instead of calling him Epiphanes, they called him Epiphanes, Epipmanes, Epimanes, Epimanes, which means the maniac. <laughs> this is the man in whose footsteps uh, Hadrian followed, as we'll see in more ways than one. Uh, Hadrian received the nickname of the Olympian, uh, because this was a temple to Zeus Olymp Olympius, and there was a colossal statue of Hadrian was built outside the temple. So Hadrian was devoted to Greco-Roman religion and to the cult of Zeus and to building up the Greek world with Athens as its capital. He won many plaudits from Greeks. Here Pausanias, a man who wrote, uh, a contemporary who wrote a guide to Greece, within my own time the emperor Hadrian was extremely religious in the respect he paid to the deity and contributed very much to the happiness of his various subjects. He never voluntarily entered upon a war. This was music to Hadrian's ear. Someone had gotten the message he was trying to, uh, trying to give. But Hadrian realized the importance of Rome as well. This is Hadrian's mother-in-law, Salonia Matidia. She died early in Hadrian's reign, and Hadrian is perhaps the first man in history to deify his mother-in-law to turn his mother-in-law into a goddess and to build a temple in her memory. He wasn't doing this to mend fences uh, with his wife and her family. He was doing it rather to uh, exemplify the motto, we are family. And the family in particular was the imperial family. His mother-in-law was Trajan's niece. And by saying, making her a goddess, he's saying, the family I have married into is divine. And if they're divine, then I have a part of divinity too. And if you worship them, then you accept me as emperor. It was a way of legitimizing himself. He also, um, not long after this, or actually later in his reign, he makes his wife Sabina Augusta, a title of respect not given to every Roman uh, ruling, ruling, uh, ruling woman. There is no formal title of empress in the Roman Empire. And here is Hadrian. We see him on a, another coin. As you can see, he is the, uh, the imperator, the victorious commander, Caesar, Trajan, Hadrian, Augustus. And sometimes he just refers to himself as Hadrian Augustus because he wants the world to think of him as a second Augustus. So here is Augustus as a young man. This is his bust in the British Museum. And here is Hadrian. 
And the big difference, as you can see, is that Hadrian wears a beard, which Augustus certainly does not. Hadrian is the first Roman emperor to wear a beard. This is not just a fashion statement. Uh, Roman men tended not to wear beards, but Greek men did. So by wearing a beard, we're not 100% sure what Hadrian was trying to say, but it's a good guess that he was trying to emphasize his Greekness and his connection to Greek culture. But certainly, he was not trying to differentiate himself from Augustus. And we see this in Hadrian's most famous building, at least in Rome, and that is the Pantheon. Uh, the dome of the Pantheon is located here. Now, the Pantheon is a temple to all the gods. It has an Augustan connection. It was originally built under Augustus's rule, and it fell into uh, ruin. It needed to be rebuilt, and it was also built in the part of the city, the Field of Mars, which was central to Augustus's building program. And Hadrian undertakes to build, rebuild the Pantheon in an utterly spectacular manner. But he does not put his name on it. Instead, he says that the building was built by Marcus Agrippa, the son of Lucius, when he was consul for the third time. Marcus Agrippa, excuse me, was Augustus's right-hand man, his friend since childhood, and, and eventually Augustus's son-in-law. Um, so by putting Agrippa's name on it, Hadrian is saying, in a way, this is an Augustan building but it was an infinitely more spectacular building than anything Augustus had built. Here we see on the inside, uh, much of the decoration of this building is original. It's spectacularly well preserved because it remained in use as a church over the centuries. So you can see the marble floor and the variegated marble. And also if you look here, you can actually see that it's wet. This is a rainy day that I took this picture. We'll see why the rain came in, in in a second. Some of you already know. But the variation in the marble is meant to illustrate and stand for the variety of different parts of the Roman Empire and the different products that came from different parts. Here you see some, the different column capitals, the different column forms. And here you can see that some of the variety continues in the decoration as we go up. And finally, the dome, so spectacular with the oculus. The eye. This is where the rain comes down. Uh, the, this is the largest dome. It's 141 feet wide, and it was the largest dome on Earth uh, until the 20th century. Um, and um, it's, it's quite remarkable. Its pattern has sometimes been compared to the regular pattern of a Roman military camp. The eye in the center has sometimes said to represent the fact that Jupiter uh, rules over all the gods. Pantheon, by the way, means the temple of all the gods. It's also said to represent the one emperor who rules over Roman lands. If you visited it today, you know that it's still an immensely impressive building, and it would have been even more so to people in antiquity. Uh, the Romans' great contribution to architecture was the dome and the vault, uh, and the Pantheon is surely uh, the greatest contribution of all. Now, Hadrian was an amateur architect himself. He was not a fan of the city of Rome. He often left it. I've already talked about the trouble that he got into with the Senate. And so he built a place of his own, a little country place, uh, about three, um, it's got about 30 buildings on it, and I think it covers 300 acres, but that may be wrong. I think it's bigger than that. It's twice the size of Pompeii twice the size of Pompeii, over 30 buildings. I'm talking about Hadrian's villa. It's not a villa. It's more like a campus. It's a series of villas with houses and uh, ponds, as this one, and fountains, and dining areas, and libraries, and baths, and theaters, and temples. It's Hadrian's retreat, 18 miles from Rome, about three hours on horseback. It's got buildings that are heated for use in the winter. Uh, and buildings that are open to the breezes for use in the summer. It's Hadrian's Neverland. It's Hadrian's alternate Rome. It's a monument to himself. Here is one of the several buildings he designs that's got the uh, inevitable dome. And here is a, a, a close-up of a mosaic uh, from Hadrian's villa. It's an absolutely stunning 
and spectacular place that allows Hadrian to retreat from the world um, and it allows him to govern near Rome without actually being in Rome. He's certainly not the only emperor who had that ambition. Now, another way in which Hadrian was like Augustus is in his use of religion. We're all used to the idea that Constantine made enormous use of religion. He is the first Christian emperor, and his conversion starts the empire on the rapid road to becoming a, a, a Christian empire from a pagan empire. But Constantine was not the first emperor who tried to create a new religion, although certainly his was the most dramatic and spectacular and perhaps the most successful. Augustus already tried to create a new religion. It was the religion of the Caesars and of Augustus' family. As you know, when Augustus was 19, his great uncle, Julius Caesar, was assassinated. And Caesar, at, upon, after Caesar's death, uh, his will adopted Augustus. His, his name was just Gaius Octavius then. Uh, he became Gaius Julius Caesar, and ultimately, after winning power in a series of civil wars, he changes his name to Reverend. Augustus means reverend. Um, and he sponsors a cult of the deification, the divinization of his great uncle, the cult of Divus Julius, the deified Julius. And the proof that Julius Caesar was divine, according to Augustus, was that he saw a comet in the sky in Rome the summer after Caesar was assassinated. Augustus also creates a cult of the emperors. He can't be worshipped as emperor during his life in Rome, but he allows people to worship his spirit, his household spirit, and to make sacrifices to his household spirit. It's, it's quite a long and interesting story. So Augustus exemplified, in the de using the death of Caesar to create a new religion, Augustus exemplified a more recent political maxim, never let a good crisis go to waste. And Hadrian followed in his footsteps by creating a new religion of his own, but a, a new religion with a very different deity, not his great uncle, his boyfriend, Antinous. <laughs> now, if you, uh, are, as I said in the beginning, if you spend a lot of time in uh, uh, classical collections and museums, you will be familiar with Antinous, because if Hadrian is the single most well-represented person in images from the ancient, uh, uh, from the Roman Empire. Augustus is the second. Antinous is the third. We have over a hundred surviving statues of Antinous, not to mention reliefs and coin images. Who was Antinous? Uh, if only we knew. He was Greek. He came from the city of Claudiopolis, which is in what is today Turkey, uh, about 150 miles east of Istanbul, um, and probably met uh, uh, Hadrian when he was about 16. Hadrian fell in love with him. Uh, he, Hadrian was married, but these things happened. And um, it's clear that Antinous uh, was the great love of his life. Now, uh, the two of them hung out together. They were both interested in hunting. And in 130 AD, they went on a trip to Egypt. Um, this was the first time a Roman emperor had been to Egypt in 60 years, and Hadrian was only the third emperor to visit Egypt after Augustus and Vespasian, if you are interested. Um, Hadrian starts out in Alexandria, where in typical Hadrian style, Alexandria is a great intellectual capital of the Greek world. In typical Hadrian style, he engages in debates with the philosophers in Alexandria. When one of them was asked who won the debates, the philosopher said, who would want to argue with the Lord of 30 legions? <laughs> Hadrian and uh, Antinous go off to the countryside. They go on a boar hunt, and they have an idyll together in a resort outside of Alexandria. And then the imperial party travels south on the Nile. 5,000 people travel south, and part of the mission is to create a new Greek-speaking city. Egypt was inhabited by Egyptians, but for centuries there had been Greek and Macedonian colonists in Egypt as well, the ruling class. The largest Greek city was Alexandria, and the second one was Ptolemaeus. And Hadrian wanted to create a new one here near Hermopolis. It would be a city called Hadrianopolis. Uh, and there were several cities in the empire called Hadrianopolis. There's still a city in today's world called Hadrianopolis. That's its ancient name. Does anyone know what I mean, the city? Adirne 
in Turkey, also called Adrianople, one of the most fought over places on earth, but that's a story for another day. Okay, October 130 AD, the, tr the party is traveling down the Nile when near Hermopolis, tragedy strikes. Antinous drowns. How? Why? What happened? Well, Hadrian wrote that Antinous fell into the Nile, period, the end. He probably wrote that in his autobiography, one of several autobiographies of, of emperors that unfortunately <coughs> doesn't exist anymore. But there were many rumors. Some, uh, no one actually said he was murdered, oddly enough. Uh, I think nowadays we'd say that would be the first conclusion we jumped to, he was murdered. But none of the ancient sources says he was murdered. Instead, they say he committed suicide. Why? According to one source, uh, because Hadrian was ill. Hadrian did have chronic illness problems. And Antinous thought that by sacrificing his life, he could save Hadrian's life, a life for a life. It's a nice story. The ancients really didn't think that way. <laughs> Antinous was between 18 and 20. Perhaps he was a mixed up kid. Another story says Antinous committed suicide in shame because the age of 20 was about the cutoff to be the junior partner in a same-sex relationship, according to Roman protocols. And this says that uh, Hadrian didn't want the relationship to end, and Antinous committed suicide out of shame. Doesn't seem all that likely to me, but um, who knows? We don't really know what, what the cause of it was. Perhaps Antinous was a mixed up kid. Perhaps he was murdered. Perhaps he just fell in the Nile, as Hadrian said. But that wasn't the end of the story as far as Hadrian was concerned. He happened to die around October 24th, which is the festival of Osiris. And in Egypt, Osiris was the god who died and was reborn, the god who promised salvation and immortality to the human race. And Hadrian said, I've got a brilliant idea. Antinous is now a god. One of his astronomers saw a new star in the sky that proved to him that Antinous was now in the heavens with the gods. And Hadrian said, that city, you know, Hadrianopolis? Uh-uh, Antinopolis. It's now the city of Antinous. It's dedicated to the new god, and we're going to start a new religion around the Roman world, the cult of Antinous. And oddly enough, it's successful. Here is a statue in the Vatican, of all places, of Antinous in Egyptian garb as Osiris. And here is a statue in Rome in the Roman National Museum of Antinous as the traditional Italian god Sylvanus, the god of the countryside. There are many, many, many images of Antinous. Hadrian set up games in honor of Antinous, festivals in honor of Antinous. The cult became very popular, especially in the Greek world, also in Italy, not so much in the western part of the empire. So popular that the fathers of the church have to condemn it and have to convince people to stop following this new religion. People are shocked. It wasn't shocking that the emperor uh, should have an affair. It wasn't shocking uh, that he should have a same-sex affair. But they were shocked that the emperor created a new religion uh, based on his deceased lover. And Hadrian came under a certain amount of criticism for that. But what about Sabina? She was there. She was on the ship. She was part of the party. And after. Um, Antinous's death, the show had to go on. The imperial tour continued, and they went down the Nile all the way to the city of Egyptian Thebes to see the famous colossal statue of the man who the Greeks called Memnon. He was the pharaoh Amenhotep III. And this statue was an incredible tourist drawer because sometime earlier, probably be, possibly because of an earthquake, a fissure uh, a, a, a fissure uh, was a crack. There was a crack in the statue. The statue was cracked. And every morning at dawn, probably because the dew evaporated, the statue emitted a sound from the crack. And so tourists came to hear the sound. And they wrote their name on the statue. And Sabina, whose traveling companion was a very educated Greek woman, and um, she and her traveling companion wrote on the statue. And Sabina, wrote an inscription that says this. Sabina Augusta, wife of the Emperor Caesar Hadrian, heard Memnon twice within the hour. Memnon is what the Greeks called the statue of the pharaoh Aaron Hotep, uh, Amenhotep 
III. I would like to attempt to translate this into modern American English. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so Hadrian, very sad, goes back to Rome. And before going to Rome, after visiting um, Egypt, he goes on to Judea. And there he visits uh, the ruins of Jerusalem. Jerusalem uh, was in ruins since the year 70 AD. Uh, the J great Jewish revolt against Rome had ended up with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem and much of the city. But the city was still, uh, ancient cities when they were destroyed usually continue to be inhabited, just in a less grand manner. Uh, there were still many Jews living in Jerusalem. We we're told there were seven synagogues. And Hadrian has an idea. He wants to rebuild the city, glorify it, make it glamorous again. Apparently early in his reign, he thought about rebuilding the temple, but now he rethought it. His new plan is to refound it as a Roman colony. Uh, it's going to be dedicated to Capitoline Jupiter, that Jupiter Zeus in Rome, and modestly named after himself, Alias is his family name. The city's going to be renamed as Alia Capitolina. Not a good idea. Uh, because it is deeply offensive to the population of Judea, and they rise in revolt. Two years later, 132 uh, AD, um, this is the, uh, we'll come back to the slide in a minute, this is the revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt. Bar Kokhba is a nom de guerre, uh, it's, it means the son of a star, and in this slide, this coin, you can actually see the star here. This may be the star. Some people think it's the star. Perhaps it's a reference to the star of Antinous. Uh, what you also see here is um, the temple. Uh, and uh, here you see a lulav and etrog, uh, Jewish ritual objects. Um, it's a very successful revolt. Uh, Bar Kokhba is a very uh, um, talented military leader. He is a guerrilla leader. And he has a unified population behind him. It takes the Romans three years to put down the revolt, a great deal of bloodshed, a great deal of loss of life, Roman uh, as well as Jewish life. Hadrian himself has to visit in order to rally the troops. He has to send his best general from Britain, which is also a trouble spot, to Judea. Finally puts the revolt down. The cost is very high uh, for the uh, Jewish population. The ancient sources claim that 580,000 people were killed. That's probably an exaggeration because the ancient sources usually exaggerate. But let's say it's only 10% true and 50,000 people are killed. That's still a lot of people. Um, the Jewish population of Judea is hurt greatly, um, and there are relatively few Jews living in Judea as a result of this revolt. Nonetheless, the Jewish uh, population continues in the Galilee it's very strong in the Galilee, and there's still Jews in Judea as well. The Romans eventually, in the next generation, make peace uh, with the Jews of Judea, and Marcus Aurelius visits them with very different results. Meanwhile, here is another uh, sign of Hadrian's presence in Judea. This is an inscription put up by a, the, a legion, uh, and here you can see the Legio Fratensis here, to commemorate the visit of Hadrian, Hadrian Augustus whose name you can see here. So Hadrian is back in Rome. It's now 135 AD, and Hadrian is not a healthy man. He's suffering from hypertension and uh, edema, um, swelling, uh, and he knows that he is dying as he approaches his 60s, as he reaches the age of 60. He has various plans to have a successor, um, but um, in the various plans fall through, and in the end, he pins his hope on a young man, on young Marcus Aurelius, who we see here uh, as an older man, as emperor. Marcus Aurelius is too young to become emperor, and so um, Hadrian chooses another man, Antoninus, to become emperor, and insists that he adopt Marcus Aurelius, thinking that Antoninus, a man in his 50s, wouldn't last very long. <laughs> He's emperor for over the next 20 years. And Marcus Aurelius isn't until, he doesn't become emperor until he's about 40. So Hadrian's attempt um, to uh, determine the succession is only partly 
successful. As he lies dying in Rome, he also strikes out. Hadrian's sister married a man named Servianus. And Servianus was another noble Roman, powerful person, often a rival of Hadrian's. Uh, he lived to a very ripe old age. He was 90, and he had a grandson uh, named Pedanius. If this were a class, I'd say to the students, don't worry about the names. They won't be on the exam. <laughs> so don't worry about the names. Uh, the point is, Pedanius wanted to be Hadrian's successor. Hadrian didn't want him, and so Hadrian has him executed. And then he forces his grandfather, Servianus, at the age of 90, to commit suicide. And we're told that Servianus curses Hadrian and says, uh, may you be so ill that you want to die, but you can't. And indeed, the curse comes true, which makes us kind of suspicious whether there was ever a curse in the first place. Uh, Hadrian is very ill, and he tries to get various people to kill him, uh, bar a, a, uh, a slave, his physician, no one's willing to do it. So Hadrian has to suffer a slow, agonizing death. Before he does, he builds a spectacular mausoleum. This is uh, Castel San Angelo in Rome, uh, a castle of the popes, originally Hadrian's tomb. It was built to rival the great tomb of Augustus uh, that was visible a half mile away on a new road that Hadrian built. And he also writes a poem here in translation by Lord Byron. Ah, gentle, fleeting, wavering sprite, friend and associate of this clay, to what unknown region born wilt thou now wing thy distant flight, no more with wanted humor gay, but pallid, cheerless, and forlorn. He finally dies not in Rome or in his beloved villa, but in another estate on the Bay of Naples. Antoninus succeeds him as emperor. And one of the few powers that the Senate has left, this is 138 AD, one of the few powers that the Senate has left is to decide which emperors can be deified or not. Antoninus desperately wants Hadrian to be deified, but the Senate hates Hadrian because of the various men, senators he's killed. And they put up a big fight until finally, a year later, they concede and Hadrian is deified. It's only then that his ashes are brought back to Rome and interred alongside those of Sabina, who's died before him, and who was deified in Hadrian's tomb. So what are we to make of Hadrian? How do we sum him up? Well, here's Hadrian's uh, temple that was built by Antoninus afterwards. Uh, it was later the stock exchange of Rome, and today it's a cultural center, a sort of Casa Adriana, if you will, uh, in the heart of Rome. Gibbon, in his famous decline and fall, summed up Hadrian this way. He was by turns an excellent prince, a ridiculous sophist, and a jealous tyrant. And it's hard to gainsay that. But let me end with, as I began, talking about the two sides of Hadrian. The three sides that were so troubling. His vanity, his intolerance, and his murderousness. But the three sides that we want to take away that were so good about Hadrian, uh, and that is his skill, his art as a courtier uh, in rising to power, his craft as a marketer in selling himself and his family and even a new religion, and above all, his genius as a visionary, someone who thought that the empire could stand for peace and someone who wanted uh, to elevate the provinces and put them on a more equal footing uh, with Rome than in, they'd ever been before. I hope that's the memory of Hadrian that we can take away. Thank you. I'd be glad to take a few questions. It continued for centuries, really. Uh, it was only finally abolished under Christianity. But uh, the games of Antinous uh, continue, the festivities, the city in Egypt uh, was a visible, apparently, the ruins were visible apparently to the early 19th century. Uh, it was mostly built of limestone and uh, uh, the lime was used, the lime was all burned. But the religion does continue. Yes, um, can you talk about Hadrian's wall and the walls that he built? Obviously, 
obviously they they were really not for defensive purposes. Right. Look at them militarily. Right. Can you talk about them as with regards to uh, tariff control, commerce control, um, border control, as far as trade, and also currency control? Because if you're going to debase your currency, you either have to go basically to war and get goods to support that, mm -hmm. or you have to manipulate the currency market somehow. Yeah, those are great questions, and I wish I was competent to answer all of them, but I can say a little bit about border control. I'm sorry that I can't say much about currency control, but um, I think the main purpose of the wall was to control the border, to control who went back and forth. I think he wanted to divide one set of British tribes from another set of British tribes, and I think he just wanted to impress people with the power of Rome. But as you say, militarily, it's not going to be all that successful. Sorry that I don't know more about the currency. Yes, I wanted to know, uh, <clears throat> Antinos, was he, was, did he also go to Britain with Hadrian? No, no. no. I think Hadrian went to Britain before he, he ever met Antinous, as far as we know. And we don't know really the circumstances of what they met, of when they met, uh, but I don't think he was there, no. You're not going to include that in your book? Uh, about how they met and so on? We don't know how they met. <laughs> <laughs> We don't know. A vast empire. Certainly, how long would it take a message to reach Rome from Syria, let's say, before mm. the internet? <laughs> Good question. It depends how it was sent and how fast the message was going, but I think weeks is probably right. So it, the communications challenges in governing the Roman Empire were very significant. And a lot of emperors really burned themselves out. I think one of the, so Hadrian is 62 and he dies, uh, which is not so young for a Roman emperor, but not so old either. And I think one of the reasons is that the guy burned himself out with all the travel. Yes. And that he named the territory of Palestine. Yes, yes. Now the term Palestine had been used before, but they officially changed the province from Judea to Palestina. That's absolutely Under correct. Adrian's yes, that's absolutely correct. Yes. Um, do you think part of, uh, you talked a lot about his, uh, how much he enjoyed hunting. Uh-huh. Yes, I do. I think it's partly a substitute for war, but also hunting uh, in the ancient cultural context is a Greek sport. It's a Greek thing to do. It's something that Greek aristocrats did more than a Roman sport. And so it, it, I think it's, it also signifies Hadrian's Philhellenism, you know, in support of Greek culture. Yes. No, they were, they were, that's a good question. They were mostly paying the military in coin. They were mostly paying them in coin at this point. But Hadrian uh, was, I mean, he, was, he knew how important the military was. He understood that, n that no emperor could survive without the support of the military. He devoted a lot of attention to the military, visiting bases, talking to the troops, uh, training them, going on maneuvers with them, having them march. Um, he was able to keep the discipline up. So uh, he handled it in that way. And the, and the terms of service and the rewards were pretty good. It's one of the few ladders of mobil social mobility open to people in, in the Roman Empire. Um, in all your personal study of the Caesars, uh, how would you rank him? Did he ever succeed in being the second Augustus? So how, how, how would you personally put him in ranking? I think his rank, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's very high. Yeah. Uh, I think that, you know, he's... A key person, the empire does become more egalitarian for the elite, always for the elite. The vast majority of the people in the Roman Empire are poor and have tough lives. Uh, the Roman Empire never brought 
majority of people up in the world in the Roman world up to what we call middle class status. But for the elite, it becomes much more egalitarian. And I think that Hadrian does do uh, do very important work in, in that. Uh, the empire also becomes. Uh, ever more a condominium of Latin and Greek, and Hadrian's very important in that as well. And ultimately, the empire does turn east. Constantine finally does what Augustus hadn't done, and he says, you know what? The most important capital is in the east. And he, he establishes, he founds Constantinople. And Hadrian, I think, is a really important way station on that. So I think, yeah, I think he is one of Rome's most important emperors, uh, a, a real middle ground in various ways from where Rome was to where it was going. Oh, yeah. What is your opinion oh, of Oh, I love it. I love it. It's just a magnificent novel. Um, I think it's one of the things that got me interested in Hadrian in the first place. And I'm sure that uh, many of you are familiar with this book by Marguerite Yourcenar, uh, The Memoirs of Hadrian. Uh, if you haven't read it, please do read it. It's just a magnificent uh, book and meditation uh, in Hadrian's voice uh, by a brilliant writer. Um, Ma'am. If you were going to give our present president <laughs> some <laughs> advice that you learned from studying Hadrian, what would it be? Oh, no. uh, uh, learn from history. <laughs> Learn from history and um, a certain amount, and be humble. Learn from history and be humble. That would be my advice. I think that's. I think there's some truth to that. I think there is some truth to that. I think that Hadrian, you know, he had this problem. He had to give the army something to do because they weren't going to expand. And he was worried, quite rightly worried, that they were going to lose their edge. And he knew there was a lot of danger out there over the frontier. So I wouldn't put it simply to that because the Romans had problems with rebellion in Britain. And there's some reason to think a legion had been destroyed. A Roman legion had been destroyed by the rebels before early, earlier in Hadrian's reign or before he took power. So I don't think it was just to keep them busy, but it's not that impressive a military defense. And, and the legions were from other parts of the empire. They're the legions were from other parts of the empire. If you go to the museum in Newcastle, it's a wonderful archaeological museum in Newcastle, the exhibit says the um, collection of people who lived in the forts along Hadrian's Wall were the most, was the most multi-ethnic group of people in Britain until the 20th century. And that may well be true. There were people from all over the empire living there. So it's quite remarkable. Quite remarkable to see the statues uh, and the different parts of the empire they represent. Yeah, some historians view the uh, century after uh, Antoninus as the uh, most prosperous, the most peaceful in the history of the Western world. Uh, should we give some credit to Adrian uh, for setting the stage for the Antonine period? Yeah, so, you know, the, uh, the, the emperor Antoni Antoni Antoninus who follows Hadrian, uh, the, the Roman Empire is very pos prosperous and peaceful. The problem is that, and yes, Hadrian deserves some credit for that prosperity, but let me just make two points. One is that it's not to be compared to the prosperity that parts of the world enjoy today. It's much, much, much more limited. Secondly, Antoninus is a very problematic emperor. The good news about Antoninus is that he maintained, that Rome is pretty peaceful under his rule. The bad news is that he pays no attention to defense whatsoever. The guy never leaves Italy while he is emperor. Uh, he's not interested in military affairs or foreign affairs. He doesn't give Marcus Aurelius any training. And Marcus Aurelius isn't ready when the disaster strikes. And the disaster is war on two fronts. Rome is attacked both in the west by various Germanic peoples and in the east by the Parthians. And Marcus Aurelius, the philosopher, ends up having to spend most of his reign in crisis management. So um, Hadrian has peace, but he pays attention to defense. Antoninus has perhaps even more peace and prosperity, but he doesn't pay attention to defense, and there's a price. 
Well, you've been a great group. Thank you very much. <laughs>